don't have to, you don't have to think this is the be all and end all. That this is, you know, the holy grail and this, whatever you do, you need to plan everything now and it's all, it's all going to be everything. When I was here, I loved the subjects. I loved history. I don't know why, but I loved history. Um, I liked biology. I used to do it in this classroom. Um, I liked art, even though I was pretty crap at it. I liked this because I could just do stuff. Um, I was bad at other, I was bad at lots of other subjects, but I, uh, geography I was okay at, I like geography as well, uh, but the main ones like Irish and that I was pretty bad at. Uh, so, uh, and what I did is, I found out the ones that I liked and what I enjoyed. So it's only when I hit fifth year, or even sixth year, when I kind of went, okay, I want to kind of do a little bit on this, and I had no clue what I was going to do. I did my leave in 2001 when I was, uh, 16, I was very young, I know we're getting transition here coming back soon maybe, but I saw it in the newspaper, but I was probably young, a bit too young and I was a bit nervous and I was a bit shy and I didn't want to go too far away from home. I had no idea whether I wanted to work, I had no idea of what I wanted to do and it, we'd only got computers in the school back then, believe it or not, right? So we got computers around, well we got them a little bit before that, but they were pretty useless. But my very, very first time I can remember being on the internet was in the school, right? That's how bad it is. You know, you have to get your phone now when you have the internet or whatever. Um, I can remember being on, it used to be at the library, in what's called now, Mr. Mead's room up there. Yeah. I was on there and we dialed up, I used to get, they used to dial up a zzzz, like a kind of a dial tone thing, up with the phone line, get on the internet. And then we got on the internet and we're like, so what do we do now? because there was actually nothing that we could do on the internet. We didn't know what to do. There was no Facebook, no Google, no Twitter, no Instagram, no nothing, okay? So we're on the internet, not knowing what the hell to do, and then we said, this is kind of boring, this whole internet thing might never take off, because um, it was kind of more like an encyclopedia to us. Do you know, like it was kind of more like you go on to to study something, but that's what we went on to it for, and then we kind of, it was a while before it took off. But I suppose what I'm trying to say is, so much can change in such a short uh, period of time, and um, when I decided, because I had a little experience of computers in here, I decided to do computers in WIT. I said, you know what, do computers, did a little bit of photography as well, and I liked that as well. So the history went by the wayside, because I didn't want to go to Dublin. And that's where you had to study history, or I had to study somewhere else, and I was a bit too, didn't want to leave Mammy. Uh, so I said, uh, no, I'll go to WIT and I study computers. And I liked this, you know, by large, I was still quite shy, still very young, but I had the four years done nearly by the time I was 20. And I always kind of felt a little bit young for it. And I, I enjoyed this. I started working in the bank then for my sins in Dublin. And started working doing databases and all that kind of stuff. Sounds boring, was kind of boring in fairness. Um, but it was kind of money. And it was great to be earning money after a while. And then randomly, it's a big notion. I really, and the point I'm trying to make is, I know to scare your parents or scare uh, Mrs. Uh, Finnegan here, but the, um, I only kind of found out really what I wanted to do when I was in my twenties, okay? And, but even though all, everything else helped, everything helped that uh, when I, what I learned in school. Everything helps when I was in WIT and all that. Because even when I was in WIT, I started making websites about history. Okay, so it was all kind of coming into us and taking photographs and stuff, you know, about historical stuff, which kind of sounds boring, uh, but I liked it. And then it was after a few years, I went, you know what, I'd prefer to do this full time. I'm over the whole computer thing now. And I ended up doing, um, going, saving up a bit of money didn't go on any holidays, and I went back and I went to UCD. And in UCD, I started studying history again, I went back into the modern history, at the age of like 29 or 30, so I was pretty old, definitely like one of the oldest in the class. Um, but I had a great time, absolutely loved this, loved UCD, preferred it the second time, because I wasn't so kind of self-conscious and young and, and all that, and, uh, and now, at that age, and then I got my degree a few years ago, when I started writing the book, it took me a few years to write the book, and then I um, started doing like walking tours of Dublin for 1916, 2016 thing. I started doing them, absolutely loved it. So eventually, I'm trying to, the point is, I'm trying to make a big long winded way of saying it is that um, even though it's important and you have to put your head down because um, you, need, you need a stepping stone of school and, and the leaving cert is not be on an end all, but you need a stepping stone of the leaving cert to open up everything else for you. you know? So you don't have to kill yourself, but you, you, like, if, if, once you have that in the back pockets, because no one ever asks me about my leaving cert anymore, you know, because nobody cares. Because when you start a job, and if you went to college, or if you did a PLC course, or even if you qualified as something like a, a carpenter, no one really cares what you got in your leaving cert. Don't want to tell anyone that. But, but to get into that space, you need to jump the milestone of the leaving cert. So it was. Um, uh, so basically, it took me a good few years to actually know what I want. So I wouldn't be stressed and I wouldn't be worried if you don't really know what the hell you want to do now, because eventually you, you will get there. 
Um, the only other thing I was going, so it literally took me nine years. I was like in 30 basically by the time I found out uh, what, what the hell I wanted to do. Um, and now I work in the Dáil for my sins, um, doing like ushering in the, in the Dáil, Leinster House with all the boring politicians, but it's a bit of crack sometimes. Like yesterday when someone resigned, a bit of drama, a bit of drama you know, keep, 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 keeps, keeps us awake. Um, but um, I suppose the, the only thing I'd say as well is, uh, like I was very kind of self-conscious maybe as a teenager, and the only thing I'd say is if you hated, if you hated school, or you're not that happy, or you think, oh no, I don't really like this, or is my life always going to be like this, or anything like that. Or if you know, even if you're getting bullied, because I know like people don't like talking about that, but everyone does, and everyone's going to suffer from it at some stage. Name calling, digs behind the back, all that kind of things, and people not sticking up for you. But I think as you get a bit, a bit, a little bit older, you will be more, you will realise how little that matters, okay? Because the bullies now, or people that slag you off, or you have a thing, you'll meet them on the street in Munkine, or Piltown, or Kilimacar, or Mullabat, or Waterford in about 10 or 15 years' time, and they won't even remember. They'll be like, well, what's the crack? How are you getting on? And you'll be like, hello, you bullied me for five years. Uh, but they, they won't remember. So uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, don't think of the major issues you have now, even though they are a big deal now, and all the problems you, got, and you, you kind of have, and you think that life's never going to get better or anything like that. It does. It eventually does. Because when you go on, you move on, you get older, you'll find people uh, that maybe you'll be more interested, you think more, you'll find what you want to do in life, and uh, and then kind of anything is possible, you know? And then nowadays, which our parents, grandparents, guardians, whoever, the thing they have, what we have that they never had, and even I have it, and you have it growing up, is that you have a bit of choice. You can, like, my, like my father couldn't just give up his work at 20 or 29 and go off and go back to college like a big lunatic because he had responsibilities, he didn't have the qualifications, he didn't have, he didn't have, um, you know, uh, he wouldn't have had the kind of the money to do it as well, you know, but, and he wouldn't have had the opportunities, he wouldn't have jobs. Like all that is open to you now and it, I think it's kind of, uh, uh, it's kind of a good thing. Um, I, I don't want to talk too much about history even though because it's a little bit back, but like, you're kind of living through it historically. Every, er, everything, whatever ha happened yesterday is history. You know, it's on about, I, I know someone who did a project last year for their, for their um, leaving cert, and the other person who did a thesis on it in college about the 2016 commemorations, right? So 2016 about how people, you know, celebrated it and what they did in the schools and what they did in Dublin or whatever. That was part of history, and someone studied what they did in 2016 as commemorations, as a project now. So basically, 2016 was a history project. Do you know? So everything is kind of history, and I think you're living through a technological revolution now, because um, I was just thinking, when I, I just told you I was on the internet the first time in this school, um, the first time I really saw a mobile phone, <laughs> and I don't think it's that long ago, or I can remember the first mobile phone coming into the school, and some guy brought it in because he thought he was really cool and he had a big brick of a mobile phone was about this size and he was into gamble on the horses. He was from Kilmacow. And I remember it was the talk of the school, the drama of someone actually having a mobile phone and betting on the horses in school and we'd never seen a mobile phone before. And it was just when Brick said you could literally only make a phone call on. No text, no internet, literally just a phone call on. And um, I remember he, he, um, he'd bring it in and he'd call up to the office and his parents had to come in and his phone had to be taken off him and it was a massive, massive deal. And it's gone from that in the space of a few years to have, I remember the next thing was texting. So we got the, I remember I got my first phone about the year 2000. Then texting only came in about two years later. And then camera phones came in a few years later, about three or four years after that. And then when Steve Jobs came along and the iPhone said, oh, we have internet on the phone, wow. And that was mad. And uh, it just changed it. So literally that's only happened. You think that's a bigger life, so you think it's a long time. But it's actually not. When your kids, your grandkids are going to be studying this part of Irish history and world history, I think they're going to call it something like the communications revolution because they're going to call it like, um, you know, the time where we went from 50 years ago, past your grandparents, whatever, no running water in the house, no electricity in Munkine, you know, outside of the villages of Munkine or Hilton around, until about the 60s, you know, so it's not that long ago. Went from no electricity, no running water, no toilets in the houses in my father's day when he was small. It went from that to electricity, telephones, uh, internet, mobile phones, and this kind of technological revolution is literally only 50 years. When you study it in history, or when you will study it in history, you look at an agricultural revolution, and bloody, um, what's the other one, industrial revolution, all that. I think this would be the communications revolution. And then that, that, that's what we're gonna call it, because it's just like after exploded. I think it's got bad things in a way, because 
you know, like fake news and all that, and you can see how things can be influenced and stuff. And I think what happened though, when we first saw the internet, I'm trying to think back on it, I'm trying to think of it as kind of a history hat, is we thought the internet was any question we want, we can just look it up, which we can. So if, when I was in school and I was studying French, or I was studying history, I literally only had the, my textbook and I had nothing else. I didn't have YouTube videos, I didn't have anything. So I literally only had the book. So I didn't understand the book or was too afraid to ask the teacher or whatever. And I didn't know anything. I couldn't look it up anywhere else. Do you know what I mean? You have everything. The reason I think it's a bad thing, right, is that there's so much out there that nobody bothers looking at any of that crap anymore. They only look at like their, their, their news feed or whatever, you know, their, their uh, Instagram or their bloggers or whatever. And all the other stuff out there, they don't bother it because they're kind of so narrow, narrow focused. But I'd say, you know, you don't know how lucky you are. So if there's something you don't know or something you're interested in, just look it up. You know what I mean? And even for this history book, something I didn't have, but even those writings. I have so much digitized stuff, so I don't have to go to archives anymore and sit down. I can look up military pensions online, .ie. You know, I can look up Bureau of Military History, which are all these stories from all these men that lived and fought and died in Munkhine and Piltown and Kilmacow and Kilkenny going back a um, hundred years ago. They're all up in the line. So you can do any project, you can do anything like that. And now, I had none of that. We literally had the textbook we had in our hand. And uh, if you wanted to go off, you had to go to the library, which I didn't really know existed. Like So it was, it was, there's, there's, so much more that you kind of have now and that you have um, that you have kind of um, that opportunities going forward but as I said don't be too um, don't be too stressed out but don't be too laid back either you know I must say if you're too laid back and going ah, I don't, that whole leaves thing doesn't matter it does still open the door but once you have the door open and you can do whatever you want then you know and you can turn back I remember we had a 65 year old in one of my classes in WIT and she was learning computers and she didn't really well at it like but she decided yeah I'll go back in college and get a degree in computers and so all that stuff is happening there now, and it's um, it's some it's things that people would have killed for years and years ago. And even when I was writing about this, um, most people back then couldn't afford to even go to secondary school. I don't know if that's the great great that's great news, but in Munkhine or whatever, only about ten percent of people went to the high school, secondary school, but you pay money first, and you had to pay money first. So this school wasn't here until 1935, and um, even at that. When this school came in in 35, it only took you for two or three years. It only took you till you were 14 or 15. But it was still great, Do you know, it was still. I always remember my dad saying that when he was in primary school, he got belted around the place, you know, beaten up by all the teachers. That's what they used to do. But then when he came in here, into Munkai, and it was still where the furniture store is now when he was here, um, he had this teacher called Dennis Buckley. And Dennis Buckley still lived in the Kilmacow, and he treated them as adults. He didn't beat them up, and if they actually made their work and made their project, he was like, yeah, good man, fair play. And he, they were minds were blown because they said, oh, actually, someone can be nice and you can actually like learning. Do you know what I mean? So all that kind of stuff is after happening. All that kind of technology um, uh, has changed and kind of the world is your right. If you are uh, stressed, uh, don't, don't get too stressed because I think everyone says that these are the best days of your life. Maybe they are enjoying, they're good. I kind of prefer my twenties and stuff better. <laughs> it was too self-conscious. So better things are uh, better things are better things are, are, are yet to come. But like I don't know, if you want to ask me questions, probably better than a geography test, you know, so throw them out there because I'm sure they can do half a geography test if they want to, but um, you know, just throw them out, I can I can chit chat about that. If you want to ask me about history, I can talk about history, if you want to talk about, you know, killing and bombing back in like thing, if you want to talk about something else, writing books, if you want to talk about I don't know, uh, the school, I can talk about that as well. I honestly don't mind or I don't care. So do you have anything, anyone to shout, sh shout off or anything at all, or even, even your teachers, anything to be interested in? How long did it take, to write? Yeah, good question, how long did it take? It took me too long. Um, it, took me like, it took me like three years to write this. I wrote 180,000 words, which nearly killed me. And, and people always ask me, the next question people always ask me is to make a pile of money off books and don't write, okay? The book, if you go into a shop, it costs 20 euro. I always say this, but people just say, oh, you're going to be rich now, you might write a book, you know, and you don't. If you go to a shop, you pay 20 euro for a book, right? The bookshop has bought it for, off the wholesaler, which is the, the printers, basically. They have bought it for about 10 or 12. So the bookshop makes 8 euro, which is fine, because they have to pay VAT and tax and all that. The writer only gets 12% of the wholesale cost, right? So the writer only, so I get 12% of 10 euro. I can work that out, I'm bad at maths, it's terrible at maths, actually, it's barely past the leaving cert. Um, but that's about one euro twenty per book of twenty euro. 
So you don't make money. Even J.K. Rowling and all, it's great. If you sell a lot of books like J.K. Rowling, you make millions. But she was still only beyond starting off 12% of the wholesale cost. So you don't make that much money when you're writing books. But it took me a long time. Um, if, you're very, if you have an imagination, because I wasn't good English either, if you had an imagination, probably better, because fiction books are better, okay? So history books, that you have to reference everything. But I like history and I like facts and I like trying to figure stuff out and getting the lives of people that lived back in the day and just normal people, not like just big guys, but normal people. And if I get that, um, um, what was I going to say again? Yeah, so if I guess, uh, try to figure all that out, but if you have an imagination and you write fiction, it's probably nearly better because fiction sells better and then you can, don't have to reference it as well. Course, um, if you, and everyone, if you say everyone has a book in them, so people can just keep typing away in a book, work on it for 10 years if you want. I did about three years and I did about six months of just hard, hard writing where I was just like stuck in a room, typing, typing, typing. But I was in my own little bubble and I kind of loved it in a way. Didn't really mind it, so it wasn't really a chore like. Um, but it was six months, but then it took lots of editing and everything because I was really bad at spelling as well. And got a lot of vocab wrong and so I had to go edit it and all that. So that really took longer. It took about six months again after I handed it in to get all that crap sorted out. So it takes a while, but it's like it's like a, my little baby now. So it's like I got hit by a bus walking out of this building today. Um, it's I have something to achieve in my life. So that's all the case. Like someone makes a table or makes a chair or builds a house or that's my. I'm not going to any of those things. So that's my little thing. So it's just like a little achievement as well. It's like you know if you win a medal, you win a county final. You should a medal you have it for life. And that's that's the kind of way I look at it. Because I win a county final as well. So there you go. Um, any other questions? Anything at all? You all looking forward to the junior cert? <laughs> uh, These are fifth years. Then. Oh, you're off fifth years. Third and fifth years. Mixture of third and fifth years. Oh, yeah, so, so you're looking like forward to junior cert. You're just <laughs> kicking back, are you? Join yeah. fifth year, start the fifth year. We're in third years. Yeah? We're in third years. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, that was junior cert stressful or did you get on okay? Yeah, we did good. Did you? <laughs> you did good. Yeah, I know, it, it, is, it is kind of tough though, isn't it? You, you still have to do history and geography and all that, so it's kind of, but it is, uh, man, it's kind of, um, you know, I, I can still remember my first day up here when we came back in fifth year, they still do this speech where they used to say to us, um, right, the junior cert's done now, it's dusted, and now we have to focus on the leaving cert. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 and I was traumatised, I was like, what? I took all my effort into the junior cert, like, I really <laughs> kicked myself for that. And, it was, and then it was like, you just throw it in the bin. But yeah, but I suppose, in a way, it's kind of this, but it, it, everything helps. If you do learn stuff, I know random things that like, people learn in school and it comes back to you when they're like 80 years old. So even though you might think you'll ever use something again, there is bits and stuff that you will learn. And then you make friends and you have all the memories as well. And it's, it's, it's good and it's bad, like, because I'm not saying that I loved every single minute of being here, because I didn't. Um, and uh, like, I, I was like, but, and it's annoying because some of the bad memories stick out more than the good memories, if you know what I mean. But, um, I, I did, I did, by and large, you know, I was kind of, I was happy here and that people were, were nice. I got to go, got to go on a few school trips and all that now as well, so that always helped. Um, but yeah, as I said, like, I wasn't top of my class, wasn't great, and I still, yeah, look, you can do what you want if you really put your mind to it. Anyone can. The best thing about when you go to college, around, or go, or you go work even in Dublin, no one gives a flying flip about who you are or where you come from. They just, they just care that you're actually decent. And that, you know, if you can do your job or you can do your thing, that's all they care about. They don't care from what kind, they don't care what you did in school. They just care that you can do your job. And that's even when we used to go for interviews, for jobs and all that. If you were able to, like, show that you worked hard or you were able to do something, they couldn't give a toss what you got your limbs I must say that you need a limbs head to jump, but they just didn't care. They said, ah, they seem decent, they seem like they'll, they'll do a job or they're hard working or they're smart or they're whatever. You get them, you know, so that's, that's the thing to remember as well. Oh, and did you find anything that, you know, you have the book and I'm yeah. looking forward to reading it. What was, like, real interesting that you're there and you're talking about yeah. the area, any coincidences or anything, say, yeah. surprises that you found out? Do you? Yeah, do you? Got some really sad and some really happy ones, right? Okay, the one of them, I was trying to think of Munkai and stuff, like, Munkai and Kilmacow and all that, what was mad about the Civil War was, um, the anti-treaty lads, I won't go into it, I know you didn't know start on this, but anti-treaty lads, free states, you know, two Irish people against each other. The anti-treaty lads, one of their main policies in this area, which included Kilmacow and Mullivac, Munkai, was to blow up the trains, blow the crap out of the train network. So the train line going through Grange here, in Munkai, and kind of, you know, going that direction, kind of Rackcorby into Kilmacow, and there's another train line going up to, um, up to like Dublin, the up to Mullivac and all that. So there was those train lines. And what they used to do with that is, uh, they, to, to annoy the Free State guys, 
they'd uh, blow up all the train wrecks. So what they do is they, uh, they saw the tracks sometimes, or what they used to do as well was actually machine gun the train, or it'd shoot at the train, and then the train driver would slam the brakes, obviously, because that's what you do if someone's shooting at you. Then they'd get everyone off the train, put a pile of bombs along the train. They'd done this in Grange and Munkhine as well. And then put the train under like acceleration straight at the bombs that are on the tracks. And then they the bombs would explode the tracks, the train would go flying off the track, crash in, blow the bridge up, which happened in Grange Bridge here. It also happened a lot in Dunn Case and Kilimacow, that's what they were picking on that. And the reason they were doing that is, okay, one, they wouldn't get caught because they were in the middle of nowhere. And two, they were trying to deny the Free State guys, because the Free State soldiers travelled by train, it's the best way to travel. And they did it because, um, uh, they did it because as well, um, just to mess up the businesses and mess up the network, because then, you know, they, they want, that's how they were fighting the war. But all this stuff happened here. And then we did the ambush in Munkhine as well during the War of Independence in his cross, uh, a black and tan was killed. And I remember just, just random stuff finding about that. You're looking at black and tan, it's like national media, black and tan killed in Munkhine, it's a big deal, it's a monument there now. And then you look at the, some of the records and you find out that the people in Munkhine village, they never even mentioned it that week, really. They, know, they talked about it, but they didn't really care, because the biggest thing that was happening in Munkhine was the pump was broken on the main street opposite the church, okay? And back then, people had no water in their houses in Munkhine, so they had to literally go down and pump the feckin' pump like this, like, you know, every year to get a bucket to wash themselves or to cook the dinner or whatever. And so the whole village didn't have water, so they were absolutely furious, going, what the hell? So they were writing to the council, writing to everyone, get the pump fixed, get the pump fixed. And you couldn't care less about the war of independence, or anything like that. So you get all those stories in as well. One of the things that jumped out at me as well, I remember reading this, and this is the real, like, oh my God, this is really tragic, is, I was looking at this guy, this young lad was killed, he was 21, and he was from uh, Castle Comer, right, so in the north of Kilkenny, and he was killed though in, in near Carrick in Clonmel. He was in the Free State, right, and he was getting, um, they were ambushed, the anti-treaties used to ambush the Free State and the lorry, so the lads would be driving along in the lorry, they, the anti-treaties would cut down a tree, then the lorry would go, oh crap, the tree knocked down, they know, they know it's one thing, bullets come flying into the lorry, and the lorry's not covered, like, you know, they're open. So they tried to hop off the lorry to get cover, and when this young lad's getting off, he gets a bullet in the head and he's just killed straight out, right? So he's 21 from Arkle Kenny. So I'd, I'd researched all that, I saw how much his mother got, like something ridiculous, like 50 pounds in compensation, like sorry about your son being killed, here's 50 quid, and um, from the Free State Government. And then I got all that, at the very end I said, oh, I better find out what age he is, right? And um, so this is the last thing I did, you know, what was the exact thing? Because when you're writing a kind of a debt thing, you have to find out what age they are. So again, this is great what new technology does. All the civil records back there are all up online. So you can find everyone's date of birth or everyone's debt up online, right? And all their births are up to uh, 100 years ago, not recent ones. But anyway, I looked it up then. I was like, oh, okay, this is really sad. Poor fella died. What age was he when he died? And, I was, and it was like, and I saw something like it was, just say he was killed on... Um, the 21st of August, I can't remember the exact date, 21st of August, 1922. So I'm where, okay, where, where, where was, where's his birth cert? Eventually found his birth cert. And then I thought it was a death cert. I said, oh, 21st of August. And then I was like, oh, it's the same thing, 21st of August. Oh, this is the number, what is it? Wait a second, what is his birth cert? 21st of August, um, 1901. Uh, so when, oh, wait a second, he was actually killed on the exact day of his 21st birthday. And that was kind of a complete freaky thing. And I was just like, oh God, that's so weird. And it was just kind of one of those things that it made it, made it more kind of real. Because then you go, oh, the poor fella has found him to death. And it's your actual 24th birthday. And you're with a gun going around and you get shot in the head to your death. You know, before you even start kind of living. So it's, um, those are the kind of things that stop you in your tracks. You know, and then there's other stories, really horrible stories. There's a little baby from Thomastown. And, and this was not to the War of Independence, but it happened in the middle of the War of Independence. A um, baby was up in Thomastown, and back in the day, you used to open fires, and they were like big open fires, not like the open fires they were big open fires where you would actually put a pot on the actual fire, and but you boiled everything. So you throw in your stew, you throw in your spuds, you throw in your clothes, you cleaned everything like that, and um, not to get her off, say, but like in different times, and uh, the child, a two-year-old child, la la la, climbed into the pot, toppled in, went into the boiling water, and was boiled in the boiled in the water and died. Do you know, so it's like, where's the baby gone? It's like in the past. So all these things happened, and you're just going, oh my God, this is actually happening to Kenny, and you're going, yeah, it did. And it's never talked about, because something like that wouldn't be, wouldn't be talked about. There's another tragic case in Kilkenny City, which happened on Patrick's in Kilkenny City, which is on the way in, if anyone ever drives into Kilkenny, and it was this young family, and it was a mother, father, daughter, and it was Good Friday, actually, that's how I remember it. It was Good Friday, right? So the mother, father, a daughter, daughter, it's her seventh birthday. 
the December Mercury was the day before, the father goes, Good Friday, they're on a holy day, so they're off work, you know, they're usually working on Friday. And they go, Grand, uh, the father goes, I'll go out and buy something for the seven year old for her birthday. So he's going along, he goes around the shop and he's trying to change uh, a note, he's got his note from work, so he has to go around and change it just before he buys that. So, and then he goes, Okay, I'll go down to the next shop and get it. And just, he's got about 15 minutes and he hears this massive explosion up the street. And they're going, What the hell is that? Um, and he goes rushing back, and then he sees all the neighbours out crying. There's an explosion, the whole door's after being blown out of his house. Everything's after going along. He's traumatised, going, what the hell is going on? Um, the neighbours come in, rush out, and drag out his, the seven-year-old and his wife out onto the street. Um, they try to ring the police, and the thing, but the police won't come, because they think a bomb in the middle of 1921 is going to be war of independence. It's going to be IRA, it's going to be the IRA trying to kill the Brits and we're not going near it. So they got no help from ambulance or no help from police. The, jingle, the, the child's out on the street. Um, the child dies straight away. Seven-year-old child dies straight away. The mother's kind of reading when her husband's there. She kind of says goodbye to him and then she dies on the street in Pekini. And your man is there. What the hell just happened? They just walked out for like 15 minutes to get a present and then my wife and my daughter is dead. And it took ages to find out. But eventually they found out that not to the War of Independence, even though it looks like it's due to the War of Independence, even though it's March or March April 1921, it's um, most random thing ever is <coughs> a bag of coal, right? And a bag of coal they throw in the fire or whatever. And what had actually happened was when they're in the mines making the coal, this is English coal, they blame the English for this again, but um, they used to put dynamite to blow. You know, they say, we're going to the next bit, we blow the dynamite and then we chip away all the coal. That was, that's what they used to do. Then we go to the next bit, we blow the dynamite. So but a little bit of dynamite had gone in to the coal bag. Right, tiny bit of dynamite. So when he threw the coal in the fire before he left the house, the dynamite eventually exploded. And it caused a massive explosion in the fire. There was a teapot over the fire like they used to have back in the day. The teapot splintered, the metal teapot splintered. And all the bits of metal flew out. And it was like a, a bomb going off because it just turned into all this metal and the, the, the wife and the children just got covered in metal. So the daughter died straight away because one bit of metal went straight through her heart. It was like a bomb, you know. And all those stories were never talked about and everything, and it's not to do war independence, but I put them in there, just remember. I think that's really tragic, really sad. And uh, they were buried in Easter Sunday then, like two days later, and like it's um, like a story that should be remembered. I know at the time people were devastated, people didn't want to talk about it, I get that. But I think now, 100 years later, you should talk, you should think about it because, you know, it's, it is very, really sad that things like that happen. Yeah? Yeah, I, I have a quick question now. Some yeah. of the fixtures here are doing history for leaving, sir. Oh, yeah. And Great. some of the torturers might pick it as an option next year as well. Brilliant. And part of that then is the research study report. They're oh, that's the new, yeah. We didn't have that yeah. in our day. And yeah. basically, a 20% project for leaving, sir. Wow. And I suppose uh, it's, a, it's a much smaller scale on something like you've done with your book. Yeah. Where they're kind of like a 1200 word report, uh, but it has to go on research. Yeah. And the State Examination Commission would like them always encouraged to do something that's a bit novel and something local. Oh, yeah. And I was just wondering, like, would there be any kind of ideas for them? And, oh, yeah, just, you know, just yeah. yeah. There's so there's so much. No, you're totally right. There is so much out there now. Like, our, we had a history professor, one guy, and he came in and said, I think, he said, the Irish Revolution is the most documented revolution of any revolutions that ever happened in Europe in the 20th century. And the reason is because we had this thing in the Irish government in the 50s where he said, anyone who fought in the revolution, write your life story there, tell us what they did. And we have it. They're called the Bureau of Military History. That's all over the So Bureau of Military History.ie, every single thing is up, it's all searchable. So you can pick out to pick any people out of that. And I reference the crap out of all these in the back of the book. So if you ever want to look at it, anything I say Bureau of Military History, it's, it's in there. The next big thing were pensions, right? These were a big deal. It's like everyone trying to get a pension when they got, uh, died. So 80,000 people applied for a pension. Only 18,000 got them. So a lot of really nice people. But all those files are starting to go. And you can pick out local people who fought and actually see. They put in every detail of like where they fought. So they might say, oh, I did an ambush down in Rack here or something. Or I organised the IRA in the or whatever. And all that's in there. So you can go back and now, you can now go, you've got the censuses online. You've got, you, so you can look up and see what age they are. You've got the, um, you've got their uh, kind of name and address. You, you've got everything they did in the revolution era and all that's free online, you don't have to leave the house, okay? The third thing I'd say is brilliant is the Irish newspaper archives, right? I use that thing and basically every single old newspaper and every single newspaper going back to last week 
Kilkenny people last week or whatever, Munster last week, is all up on this website. And this was God sent to me, right, because I can literally sit at home on my laptop, I don't know what the description is in, in here, but you can literally go back to every, to Kenny people for, and just flip through the paper. I know it's kind of boring, just little snip, snip, snip down, but you can go and go, I found the story of that, that, that child mm. getting killed with the, with the cop on the Kenny people, do you know? And I was like, what the hell is this? And then you can zoom in and you can read it and then you can go find out. And then there might be a court case or something after it, you can find it, piece it together like that. And so literally you can go on and you can say, what is the big story of the day this week, 100 years ago? And I said, I was trying to say the flu was there um, as well this week, 100 years ago. Everyone was dying from the flu in Kilkenny. And um, like you can pick out the bits that are, um, you know, um, and there you can go. Say, that's a good example. Everyone died from the flu in Kilkenny this week, 100 years ago. Terrifying. Most people that died were aged 15 to 35. No paracetamols, no antibiotics. It only came to Kilkenny on 25th of October um, 1918, which is 100 years ago, next week or the week after. And by the end of the year, it killed nearly 200 people in Kilkenny, minimum, okay? And it ended up killing nearly three or 300 in the next few months. It was a big deal. Most of the young people that died. And um, you can just look up all their tape records online, irishgenealogy.ie. So you can nearly put piece together someone's life story just using a few online resources without ever having to go off to an archive or look up something. So like, I, like, so if I was saying that, is look through something like that, and the newspapers aren't laid out nicely as they are in, nowadays. Or look, just look up the Irish Independent from 100 years ago, the Irish Times or whatever, and look up something that you find interesting. There's things like farm prices, you know, like, so stupid, you know, like, you know, building houses in one kind, or another one is the doll where I work now, which sounds very boring, right, but they have put up every single word that was said in the doll in the last 100 years, okay? So that is really, really boring, and you only reread really it if you're suffering from insomnia and you want to get out to go to sleep. But, the good thing about that is you could type in Munkine or in your video and say, when was Munkine mentioning the doll in the last 100 years? And you will get every single time Munkine has mentioned the doll after. So it doesn't matter if it was last week or in 1919 when the doll was set up. It's actually 100 years in January is the doll was set up, so it's a big, we're at a big anniversary in four months' time. But um, uh, you can then go and look. So there's so much stuff that's online. So I'd say newspaperandarchives.com or .ie, I can't remember what it's called. Um, Bureau of Military History, Military Service Pensions, put search Munkine, search one name, search Kilkenny, whatever you want to do. Um, you can just, it's all searchable, it's all Google. None of that was available 10 years ago. You would have to go into a library and go through each newspaper like that, and that was him. Do you know what I mean? Now we can just search for, you know, kid getting killed and, you know, can come up, like, you know? It, it's, it's crazy, like, you know? Um, and then Irish Genealogy Study is all the, the death search and birth certs. So, so much of what can be done and research is all up and right. So, just kind of, you can do whatever the hell you want. You know, you really, really can. Hmm? Yeah, true. True, I've got about creameries. Who's an expert in the creameries there? She's, she's trying to promote her own thesis there. Um, yeah, no. Yeah, the creameries are deadly. Because, okay, so it might sound deadly, but you know, if you're farming, your family farm, everyone farm back today, everyone grew own vegetables. Look up the creamy records and then you have. Uh, then you have what your, how much milk they brought, how much cheese they made, how much butter they made, how, your, how much they got for their, you know, your, your parents got. Creamery in um, Cargeen, Clogga, Hilltown, uh, and everything like just how people live and survive. So there is literally so much here. It doesn't have to be about the big guys, it can be about anything. Look up the list of people that fought in one kind in of the First World War. There's another example. There's a book out there that has every single person that fought. John Carroll did this. You can just look for everything in Munkine and get there's their life stories. And then look up their lives. Find their family member. So there's, I, I counted maybe over 20 people from Munkine that have fought in the First World War, at least. And they definitely have families. Maybe it's your great grand uncles or something, I don't know. And see if you have any pictures, any medals, any, any, any family. Or let's go down to some person that go, hey, did someone belong to you fight? And then you might have a story. And then that's part of your project. You know, there is literally so much out there that was never available to us. We had nothing, only the books we had. Like, it's crazy. So you're all, you'd be on streets ahead of us, streets ahead of us. Okay, now I know there's six years. Yeah, left. sorry, yeah, yeah, I want to leave you off. Before I let them in, could I just ask if the fifth years just move up to the top? I want to take a photo of fifth years with Owen. If any of you have not have signed oh, no to photographs, that. that's fine.